Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 2021 online RTRs. I'm Sue Ann Carlson. I'm the executive director of Homes on Wheels Alliance. Sometimes we call it HOWA, H-O-W-A, by its acronym. And HOWA is the host of these this year's RTRs. Today, we are going to talk about campground etiquette and specifically about uh, what it means to uh, have good etiquette in a campground while boondocking and in parks. And we have two, two guests with us today. Uh, our speakers are Joni Zander. Uh, she is on your 2021 RTRs committee and a uh, hardworking woman. Uh, she is also the secretary of the Board of Trustees for Homes on Wheels Alliance. Joni is physically, her camp is in California today, and she has a website and a YouTube channel I would love for you to visit. Please go in and check out that link to her YouTube channel in the description below. And uh, at your leisure, good stuff there. Uh, Joni has been a nomad for three and a half years, and she lives out of a Sprinter van that she had built out but designed it herself. Our second speaker is Deborah Dickinson, who is a dear friend of mine. Deborah is, uh, I believe, physically in Arizona right now, and uh, Deborah has a YouTube channel as well. Super easy to remember because it's her name, Deborah Dickinson. And Deborah has been on the road first in a van and now in a class C for five and a half years. Please help me welcome Deborah and Joni. And Joni is going to take our first 15 minutes with Deborah taking the second uh, 15 minutes. And then we will have a full half an hour for your questions. So write them down, get ready to ask them. Joni, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, Sue Ann. I am so grateful for your leadership and the amazing team that have been producing the RTRs this year. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be with you again. And I want to assure you that this is my last presentation for the 2021 RTRs. I won't be presenting all the classes. It just seems like that so far. <laughs> so as Sue Ann mentioned, this class is camp etiquette. This class is especially designed for people who are new to the road and those wanting to learn before heading out. We'll be covering what we consider to be the best practices in nomadic living. The best place to start is Leave No Trace. LeaveNoTrace.org is a HAWA sponsor and their seven principles of Leave No Trace provide an, easy, an easily understood framework of minimum impact practices for anyone visiting the outdoors. So principle number one is to plan ahead and prepare. So this includes regulation, knowing the regulations and the restrictions. So that would be things like, is there a burn ban in your area? Or is there a limitation on dispersed camping currently? Um, any of those types of things. Um, also knowing whether or not you are actually on public lands. So the BLM is a, a big checkerboard and it's really easy to think you're on BLM land and not actually be on BLM land. So I recommend using the US Public Lands app. Um, it You do have to pay for it, but I think it's a one-time fee for like three bucks or something. And it's totally worth it to know that you're not on somebody's private land when you're out boondocking, especially if you set up kind of an elaborate camp. And then another thing to know or to think about with regulations is group size limitations. Um, you just want to be respectful of, of the regulations of the area that you're going to be camping in. The second is travel and camp on durable surfaces. So you want to only use established roads and drive so slowly that you aren't kicking up dust. Um, that's a huge nomad etiquette deal because <laughs> you don't want to have somebody ram by your your rig and then just be you know have dust everywhere i mean we do get a lot of dust in in our rigs anyway especially in the desert but um, we don't need any extra 
when hiking or walking, stay on the trail. Don't be blazing new trails. And when walking in the desert, try to stay on rocks and gravel to avoid disturbing what's called the cryptobiotic crust. So this is a fancy name for that blackish raised crust. And the desert needs that crust to hold needed moisture and it's easily damaged by footsteps and it takes a really long time to regenerate. And you also wanna only set up camp on hard surfaces without vegetation. So um, don't be running over um, trees and bushes, well, not trees, don't be running over bushes and ground cover when, when you're trying to get to your camp or when you're actually there camping. Uh, especially in the desert, these little bushes, you know, they'll be like this big and they will be, you know, 50 years old. <laughs> and so, you know, things grow very slowly in the desert and we don't need to be uh, making it harder on the environment. Principle number three is to dispose of your waste properly. This one is huge. Um, now you've probably heard of pack it in, pack it out, um, but we'll kind of decom de kind of unpack that <laughs> and, um, and expand on that a little bit. So first of all, uh, let's talk about your own bodily waste. So when you're boondocking um, for a long period of time, um, and you're collecting your pee in a bottle or a bucket, pour your pee on rocks, not plants, or use it to put out your fire. That's not gonna hurt anyone or, or any plants. Um, and then for your poo, you either wanna bag it and pack it out to dispose of it, or you wanna dig cat holes. And I'll go into cat holes in just a sec, but I also wanna talk about um, gray and black tanks. So if your rig has um, gray and or black tanks, you want to um, you want to empty those in sana in sanitary dumps. So sanitary RV dumps, and you can find um, you can find a website that a lot of websites that um, that show you where those are. Sometimes there's a fee, sometimes they're free. If you do dig cat holes, make sure and a cat hole is. It's just a little hole to poop in. Uh, make sure that they're at least 200 feet or about 70 adult paces away from a water source. And cat holes should be six to eight inches deep when, they're, when it's in organic soil, like in a forest, and four to six inches deep in the desert. Um, organic soil has microorganisms to break down the waste, but in the desert, that's not present and so it, you have to rely on the heat to break it down. So that's why it needs to be more shallow. You need to make sure it's not in a wash and if you can make your cat hole on a south facing slope so that it gets hotter. And um, you don't if you're there for a long time you don't want to reuse the same cat hole. A cat hole should be single use only and you want to um, you want to just spread them around. You don't want to have them all in a congregated space. Okay, let's talk about your toilet paper. <laughs> so um, those of you who've been out on public lands have seen toilet paper. Um, don't put it in your cat hole. Don't just potty anywhere on a bush and leave your toilet paper. You have to pack out your toilet paper. Um, tampons are their own special deal in that they can't be thrown away or I mean, they can't be buried or burned. So you have to bag them up and throw them away. So if you're using tampons, um, what you might want to do is just have a baggie that you just throw the used tampons in and seal it up each time and then throw it away when you leave. Um, you do need to pack out all of your garbage. So cigarette butts are garbage, bottle caps, zip ties are garbage and they're common litter that's found at almost any campsite. Uh, so you don't wanna be that nomad. Um, and even apple cores and orange peels and banana peels and any of that stuff need to be packed out. They take a surprisingly long time to disintegrate and can attract wildlife that, um, that then becomes a nuisance around human camp areas. Um, 
you also don't want to leave any trash in the fire pit, even if it's burnable, even if it's, you know, cardboard or paper, don't leave it behind for the next person. And if you burn pallets, be sure to remove the nails. Um, that is a really common nuisance in the desert areas that are popular for boondocking. A lot of tires have been ruined by the nails of pallets. And, um, and then don't, you see a lot of times around popular boondocking areas, broken glass everywhere. If you break glass, do not leave it behind. Please don't leave it behind. Um, it is, you know, it's dangerous for people, it's dangerous for animals, and, um, and it's unsightly. And please do not leave trash at your campsite and call it art. <laughs> um, you might think it's art, but we're, we're trying to be in a natural space and we want to leave it as a natural space. And that leads us to principle number four, leave what you find. So don't gather firewood unless it's a designated firewood collection area. And those are usually in forests. Animals need the sticks and desert plants have been growing for much longer than you would think. Don't rearrange the rocks or clear them. If you do have to clear some rocks for your tent space, be sure and replace them before you leave. And um, I actually learned this from Sue Ann at my first WRTR, leaving a place better than you found it means leaving it so that you can't tell that a human was there. And this allows for everyone behind you to enjoy the natural space as well. Principle number five is minimize campfire impacts. Use only existing fire rings. If there's no ring, dismantle it before you go. Only gather wood where specifically allowed and not in desert, um, not in the desert because the critters do need that wood for habitat. So only buy wood from a local source so you're not transporting invasive species of bugs. And only burn, uh, only build what you will burn. So if you're, when you're building your fire, only build it as big as you'll burn it um, and allow it to burn all the way to light gray ash. And when you're putting your fire out, put it out completely with water or your urine, but not dirt. As explained in the Leave No Trace principles, dirt may not completely extinguish the fire and no one wants to be responsible for a massive wildfire. Principle six is to respect wildlife. Just remember that we are visiting their home. They're not invading us, we're invading them. So observe them from a distance. Don't touch, get close to feed or pick up wild animals. It is stressful for the animal and it is possible that the animal may harbor rabies or other diseases and feeding wild animals can make them aggressive toward humans. Store your food securely and take your trash, even kitchen scraps with you. And principle number seven is to be considerate of other visitors. So this, there's a lot here and I'm gonna go through really quickly. Um, so keep noise to a minimum. If you have to run a generator, only run it when you need it and when you know it won't be disruptive. If you know you'll be using a generator, don't pick a boondocking spot right, spot right next to someone with a bunch of solar unless they're your friend and they want you there. And know that sound travels much farther in the desert than you would ever expect. So your music, your generator, your voices all carry much farther than you would know. Uh, please control your pets. If your dog barks a lot, you're not gonna wanna leave them alone in your rig to annoy others. Um, keep your dog on leash and pick up after your dog wherever you are. Even if you're on a remote trail, pick up your dog poo. Um, don't direct bright lights at other campers. If your rig has outside lights, please turn them off. Uh, they ruin night vision and diminish the enjoyment of the night sky. And if you feel you need safety lights, use a motion detector. Make sure you have a mask every time you leave your rig because you never know when you're gonna run into somebody else. Uh, if you're camping with others, communicate with them. That will erase all, or that will minimize all the misunderstandings. And don't assume someone needs your help unless they ask you. It's condescending and just not very respectful. We know you mean well, and here's a way to offer help that has a better chance of being received the way you intended. Simply say to them, hi there, 
Do you need any help with that or are you all set? And if they're all set, say, hey, have a good one and move along. You've made it known that you're helpful and if they need your help, they will come find it, find you. One thing that's surprising for newbies is that you aren't expected to host fellow campers like you would in a sticks and bricks. Everyone brings their own, their own chair, their own food, their own drinks, their own plate when invited to dinner. When camping with others, offer to get firewood or chip in and don't invite other people to camp with your group without talking to the other people in the group. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Deborah. Uh, thank you, Joni. Those are wonderful, wonderful tips. I'm glad you covered them. And I also want to thank Sue Ann and the Howa staff and the Howa board for all of the hard work that has gone in to presenting this 2021 online RTR. It has been amazing to work with them. And a special shout out to Bobby, the RTR presenter coordinator, who has spent countless hours keeping us all on track. And also to Bob of Cheap RV Living for creating the RTR in the first place. And it's been a pleasure to work with Joni to co-present this to you guys today. So she covered a lot of things and, and, and we're grateful for the Leave No Trace sponsorship. I'm going to also cover some specifics within campground etiquette, boondocking etiquette, and even park etiquette, and then get down to some nitty gritties of that. So y'all stick with me on that. But first let's talk about the difference of overnighting versus camping. And there is a huge difference and some people don't seem to think so. But overnighting, for example, can be like at Walmart, Cracker Barrel, Cabela's, Bass Pro Shops, even truck stops and rest areas. And you guys, that is overnighting. That's not camping. Don't put out your lawn chairs. Don't put out your canopies. Don't put out your grill. And if you can move maneuver inside your rig with, and you have slides and you don't need to put the slides out, don't even do that. And that's what's called, I think, urban camping. And that is just plain etiquette for the people that are allowing us to have that privilege. And if we don't obey those etiquette ground rules, we're going to keep losing places that let us stay overnight. So please remember overnight is not camping. And also there's mooch docking. I call it that when you are staying with friends and relatives or on someone's property. And you want to, of course, ma maintain all etiquette that you can to honor them. But also you need to know your city ordinances or county ordinances or wherever you may be staying so that you don't get in trouble and you don't get your host in trouble because you don't want that to happen. And so when you're talking about rules and laws and regulations, of course, in campgrounds, those are usually posted, but it's not always just fee-based campgrounds. For example, public lands can have campgrounds that are free, as can like city and county parks. Sometimes you can stay overnight for free and they'll tell you how long you can stay. And I encourage you again, if it's overnight only, don't do camp sprawl because you're getting there and you're staying overnight and you're leaving. And like all of the things that Joni just went over, leave no trace when you do. And make sure that wherever you are staying, if it's especially a campground that you know the rules and for state parks and national parks. But I wanna to cover today, and, and, and that's on each of us to know those, but I wanna to cover today some of the unwritten aspects of etiquette and guidelines. But first let's talk about LEOs and governing agencies. LEOs are law enforcement officers, and that can be local police, it can be the county sheriffs, it can be rangers, and for example, BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, is governed by the Department of Interior, whereas the National Park Services, I mean Forest Services, are governed by the Department of Agriculture. So each one is going to have their own rules, laws, and regulations for you to follow so that you are within proper etiquette, and it's going to have different LEOs that respond to different things. But here's what I want to stress. It's not like in the city in, when you're in sticks and bricks dwelling where maybe your default for a dispute is to call the Leo. It, in, when you're out here and you're camping, even if you are in a campground or boondocking or in a park, it's a little bit different 
upfront, that is not your default, or at least it shouldn't be. It should be the last resort. And that's why all of these things that Joni and I are presenting today are so important because it helps you understand and, and helps you have a good time as well as everyone around you so that hope Hopefully nothing comes up to where you feel like you have to get Leos involved because they are a resource that is already spread thin as far as staffing and as far as budget. And we don't want to be those people that add to their burden. So keep in mind what all Joni told you. And so campgrounds always post their quiet hours, right? And it's usually 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. And that usually includes generators. And Joni went over that. And so if you're going to be boondocking, though, out in remote areas on public lands, like she said, don't pull up next to somebody with solar if you think that your generator might bother them. We try to uh, do the quiet hours, 10 p.m. to 8 a.m., even out boondocking. And sound carries, like she says, across the desert and across water. So right now I'm camped with a wonderful group of friends and we try to keep it quiet. But what if you think you're being quiet at 1130 at night and you don't realize how and you're around the campfire and having a good time. And you don't realize how sound is carrying and the guy across the lake might not think so or your neighbor down the down the desert road might not think so. And then that's when you get into dis disputes and everything. So it's kind of an unwritten thing, even on public lands, to keep the noise down between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. And so let's talk about boundaries. You know, as um, I was a former Texas Parks and Wildlife Ranger, and we do consider people to have dominion over their campsite. So think of it as a bubble around somebody's campsite or their rig. And, you know, I hear people all the time talk about uh, public lands. You know, it's public lands, nobody can tell me what to do, and it's not your campsite. Well, you know, I've had people that have even uh, come up and uh, driven their bicycle that I didn't even know across my mat right outside my door or walk right past my window and scare me to death. And so it try to go around somebody's campsite. <clears throat> Excuse me, you guys. And so the other thing that I think is funny, there is a movie coming up, Nomad Land, and everybody should watch it. Sue Ann is in it, Bob Wells is in it, and it's winning a bunch of awards. But the one thing that I thought was funny in it is that they have people knocking on each other's rigs when they want to talk to somebody. And out here, if you get a knock, we talk about you don't want to get the knock because that means a Leo is calling. You when, And we'll talk in a moment about how to approach rigs and honor that boundary and even how to approach individuals. The thing that I think is most important to keep in mind is that everyone is out here for different reasons. Some people may come out uh, right now in Quartzsite, there's a lot of people coming out to uh, gather with friends and go to the big tent. And then some people may be coming out for a holiday or a weekend to let their hair down from work. And other people may be out boondocking and camping, and even in campgrounds uh, for quiet and nature. And like Joni said, to gaze at the stars. And so I think when you get people that have a lot of exterior lights, like she mentioned, versus the people that want to stargaze, or you have people that want to commune with quiet nature, and they've got people that move in, and they've got their, their loudspeakers going, or whether it's TVs or music, that's when you kind of run into discrepancies and when disputes start happening. And so keep in mind who you're parking around and what the different reasons might be of why your neighbors might be there. And if you are going to approach rigs, and again, I'm talking right now about solo camping. We'll talk about group camping in just a moment. But on solo camping, if you're going to approach a rig, maybe stay out a ways and call out if, if their name, call out to see if they're home, see if they answer. If you think they didn't hear you, come in a little bit closer and call out and see if they answer. And if they don't, I suggest you move on. Don't, don't bother them. And same thing if I, I have had people when I'm out walking my dog uh, want to come up and talk and everything and, and that's great. But just because somebody is out and about or even just because they are outside of their rig doesn't mean that they want company. So it's the same anywhere. I think that's true even if you were in your front yard and doing something doesn't mean you want your neighbors coming over. Maybe you've got limited time. 
So just keep that in mind and kind of play that by ear. But again, read the body language and even ask them if, they, if they've got a moment or if they are uh, uh, trying to uh, camp solo and, and enjoy quiet time. You know, uh, we I did a funny uh, uh, spoof on camping etiquette, and Sue Ann was even in it with me in 2017. And we have one of the guys come up. We did everything in that video that you're not supposed to do. And he comes up and he bangs on a rig and he goes, hey, anybody in there? Come on, come on out. Let's party. And uh, there's just some things that out here that seem like common sense. But not necessarily so. You may be wanting to socialize, but your neighbor may not. So if you're in groups, uh, Joni covered a lot of that, um, you know, bring your own dishes and all of that. And if you're going to communicate, you can set up texting ahead of time. If you're in the group, you probably know each other and you can do texting or you can uh, set up WhatsApp or you can do uh, even a Facebook Messenger chat group. And am I on five minutes? Yeah, thank you, Deborah. <laughs> I want to let all of our folks that are watching you right now know that we have opened up the text chat so that they can type in your questions for both Deborah and Joni. If the text chat doesn't come up for you, which it probably has not, please refresh your screen. And if you're in a browser, usually that's like a round arrow. Click on that and the text chat will pop up for you. Thank you, Deborah, for letting me interrupt. And the floor is yours again. All right. Thank you, Sue Ann. So we'll wrap it up because Joni and I are looking forward to jumping into the chat room on and, and answering any questions you might have and saying hi on a personal level. But I, I, I think what I want to share with you right now is, you know, ask an elder, you know, that respect your elders. But ask an elder, and preferably if you're going to go by etiquette guidelines, ask somebody that has actually been full-time at least more than a year, Joni three and a half, me five and a half, and see what is, is, is right. And there's all kinds of Facebook forums, and CRVL has a forum. But mostly, I think today, I want to stress to you, please pass on etiquette. We used to all learn it as children, and it's not being taught anymore as much as it used to, so pass it on to your kids and your grandchildren and if you have a chance to camp with others help educate them as well and my biggest thing is to leave no trace I'm so glad they're a sponsor and that Joni covered that that was even my first video in 2016 it is so important to me so please be sure that whether you are solo camping or with a group that you help others learn how to do that and lastly, if you're in a group, I want to say don't ghost people. And by that, I mean, if you're in a group, say bye. At least let somebody know that you're leaving um, out here. If, if somebody leaves abruptly and we don't know why, uh, we tend to worry. Not worry about that, but just want to make sure that our fellow members that were in the group are okay. And I'm going to close with by saying, uh, you know, respect that bubble. I have to close up and shut my door because somebody literally, as I was prepping for this class, parked 20 feet away from me and it's a huge fifth wheel and I'm out in the middle of an open desert and that's okay. It's public land, they can do that, but there wasn't any reason for that. And so I have a little bit of camp sprawl going on and I can't just turn my key and go. So I'm going to tell you the number one thing that you can do when you run into a situation like that is go and don't do camp sprawl so that you can do that on a moment's notice. So Joni and I look forward to joining you in the chat room and we both have YouTube channels. I hope you'll subscribe and ask us more questions there. Very good, Deborah. So we'll bring uh, Joni back with us and uh, so you can see the all three of us on the screen. Uh, so this first question, I'm just going to assign the questions, but uh, whoever I've assigned it to, if the other person wants to answer or add anything, please feel free. So uh, this first question, Joni, is for you, and it's from Merle, and she asks, is it okay to mark off the area around your rig to keep people out of your campsite, like cones or rocks or caution tape? Sure, to an extent. Um, so, especially in the time of COVID, um, to be able to kind of create your bubble, um, especially if you're in an area where, um, where people aren't respecting the boundaries. 
And so like Deborah was explaining, walk around people's campsite. Um, and a lot of times van lifers will, um, will kind of leave a few things behind when they run into town. And, um, and that's okay too. I mean, we don't own our spot and it's certainly okay to just pack up everything and leave and come back and find a different spot if someone's already taken where you were. Very good. Okay, Deborah, I'm gonna give this one to you and it's from Vernon. And he asks, I've always wanted to know, how do you feel about your YouTube fans approaching you on the road? <laughs> well, hi, Vernon. You know, it, it is one of those things. It, it's uh, you guys know us, it, it, and we don't know you. This is would be the first time that we're seeing your face or hearing your voice or or, or getting to know you. And and for me, it's always a, a little shocking. But I never want to be standoffish. Uh, there have been a couple of times where I just was. Uh, I, I I for example, I had just learned that someone in my family had died. And I was uh, trying to finish up my errand and, and get back out to camp and someone approached me and I honestly don't even remember what I said with them at the time. And I thought later, I, 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 I don't think that experience went for them like they had hoped and, and it certainly didn't me because of what I was personally dealing with. And so I, I just, I, I want people to understand that aspect that, that you know us, we don't know you. Give us a little bit of grace if we miss the mark on, on being personable and, um, and, and making that connection that you were hoping for. And um, I, I'm always up to meeting people because if I'm not, I'm like, like I said, I'm like, my favorite camping is miles and miles out where I don't see another rig. And so if I'm in town, I'm almost expecting to see people and interact but if i get it wrong just give us some grace <laughs> thank you deborah okay deborah i'm going to pitch this one to you as well okay and it comes from debbie and she says i'm a solo rv woman i'm most comfortable parking near other nomads when i park in a walmart parking spot but whenever i camp closer to other campers i get the feeling they don't like it how close is too close to camp in a parking lot? How many spaces between vehicles do you recommend? Wow, I tell you what, uh, Walmart, Cabela's, any of those that I listed uh, in the uh, camping etiquette uh, uh, portion of my presentation, uh, you know, a parking lot to me is it, fair game. I, I, I'm sorry, but there, there's stripes, <laughs> you know, and, and a lot of people will park against those stripes and I get it because they're long, but that, you know, and Walmart in those places usually tell you where they want you to do that. And um, so, you know, yeah, there you're not going to want to pull up right next to somebody. But I, I would say for me, my comfort zone would be to have one or two spaces between me and the next rig. But that doesn't mean I get to get that. <laughs> I, it, you, you know, the, the, in, in, a, in a parking lot, uh, all bets are off and it's parking. It's not camping. So if you're just there and you're sleeping and you're moving on, it doesn't much matter anyway. <laughs> That's right. And um, if I could add a little bit, I, I kind of like to um, feel like leave as much space as possible and then fill in kind of equidistant. So um, I, I feel like that's like the most considerate. <laughs> yeah, and, and I've, I've, I've parked and had nobody around me in, in a parking lot and checked with the managers and I was in a great spot and I wake up the next morning and there's just hundreds, you know, it just, or maybe not hundreds, but dozens at least. And, and so you just never know in a parking lot. Right, right. Like you said, it's uh, overnighting, not camping. There you go. Okay, um, Joni, uh, Kathy says, I travel with small dogs and some dog owners won't keep their aggressive dogs on leashes on BLM land. I have asked them to do so and they refuse. Should I report them to the rangers since they are breaking the law? Um... You know what, I'm going to throw this one over to Deborah since she has dogs and she has been a ranger and <laughs> and talked about the law enforcement officer. Sorry, Deborah. 
that's okay. I was I was looking forward to seeing how, how you answered it because I hope <laughs> education is being passed on. Uh, I, I go with in the city, your default is call the Leos and sticks and bricks. Out here, try to manage it your, yourself if that is an issue and you're parked and you can turn that key and roll. That would be my number one uh, request of you. Is it on them? Is it is it is it on them to obey the rules, laws, and regulations of public lands? Yes. And are they disobeying that? Yes, because that is a requirement. Is it worth? Um, I, if you want what I, if you leave and you want to turn their license plate and location into a jurisdiction office yourself. You can do that to stick around and wait on the Leos to come and, and make it a confrontation. I don't know that I would recommend that because I know how valuable and how uh, low they are on resources. So I, I guess that's an ambiguous answer, but uh, yeah, it is on them to uh, obey that law. And I would move on down the road and then report them to the local office, wherever that is, wherever you happen to be camping. Right. For newbies, um, it's hard to get out of the mindset of being in the sticks and bricks when you don't have the option to move. You're ready to fight. But we yeah. as nomads have wheels so we can do the flight op option. Right. Exactly. And that, that goes for any neighbor doing anything that you don't care for. And if you've already approached them and they're still doing it, take advantage of your key and wheels. And don't do camp sprawl like I currently have, where it's going to take you a day to pack up. I've got a tent and a mat and a barbecue grill. And <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, uh, Joni, I'm going to try to lob this one at you again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. This is from Dora the Explorer. <laughs> what are the rules regarding bringing in firewood from other areas? I have heard that can introduce pests into the area. Can we legally collect firewood from national forests? Yes and no. It depends on whether it's firewood season. <laughs> they, uh, you'll need to check with the Forest Service and find out at the ranger station. Um, bringing in firewood, you just want to purchase it locally. So usually in a place where you're camping, there's going to be some place local to purchase it. So don't bring it from home if you're going, you know, counties away. But if you're just going to your local national forest area, yes, you can buy it from your local store, um, convenience store, whatever, and, and bring it out with you. Very good. Okay, Deborah. This is from Arvine in Style, okay. who asks, uh, some people dump all their trash in the fire pits, even though glass can't burn. Besides cleaning up after them, what would, can we do to discourage the behavior? Well, I think education is key, and, and I'm so proud of uh, Howa, for example, and Bob and the past RTRs and all of the classes that we do. I'm, I'm so grateful to all of the YouTube channels that talk about camping etiquette and the do's and don'ts. I think education is key as far as uh, discouraging. And uh, the best that you can do is like Sue Ann shared and Joni said that she learned from her at her first RTR she went to was to leave it better than you found it. And if that means cleaning up after the people that didn't know or didn't care, unfortunately those people exist, that camped there before you, then please do that and then pass, that, pass it on, pass on the education of what to do in the future. And that was a great uh, RV, what, what was their name again, Sue Ann? I love that name, RVing. Oh, RVing in style. Yeah, that's a great name. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Joni, yeah. this is from Glenda. And she asked, is it acceptable to block off a large area for my friends who may join me later? I don't like to camp alone because I don't feel safe. It depends on how long you're gonna be blocking it off, really. Um, I mean, you, people can come in, um, but 
as they come in, you can try and dissuade them. But if they're insistent on coming in, if especially if it's public lands, BLM, they can come in. Um, but use your persuasive skills <laughs> and just let them know that you're that you're waiting on your friends and and you and you're you know going to be running a contractor generator all night. Maybe that'll scare them away. <laughs> <laughs> These are some really good questions, you guys. Very good question. Okay. This one is from Greg. And I'm going to, uh, Deborah, send this to your way. Okay. Uh, the, Joni, you may want to chime in. We are finding that locals want to drive us out of BLM areas on weekends because they consider the area theirs. Any suggestions on how to handle this? Mm -hmm. it, can, it can get heated at times as they drive their ATVs through our camping areas? You know, I, I, the longer that I'm out here, the more that I see this becoming a conflict. And so I, I tell you what I do on holidays and weekends, if at all possible, is I get as far away from towns and cities as I can, because they, they really have limited time to get out and enjoy nature. And they, if they're not going to travel very far, they are used to using those immediate areas and they usually have been working very hard during the week and they are ready to let their hair down and that directly conflicts with those of us that do this full time and that are out and about for quiet and nature and solitude and peace. And so I, I, I you know, whereas when I was working, I used to live for the weekend I now dread the weekends if I have to be camp close to towns or cities. And um, so again, it's kind of that turn the key and go, manage it by, uh, by doing the opposite, getting away from them and letting them have that area if at all possible. And, and if you can't, um, I, you know, that changing your tolerance level, I've had to do that over the years is to just know that we're all out here usually for different reasons and uh, kind of give them um, the respect in their due and talk to them if possible. And if for whatever reason you can't turn the key and go somewhere else that, you know, there are Leos available to help, but they're usually not breaking rules, laws and regulations to where Leos can get involved. So I would just say go. Thank you. And I can't add to that. That was beautiful. Thanks, Deborah. That was so respectful of all concerned and very considerate. Thank you. Okay, Joni, this is from Zoomer. How fast can I drive around camping areas on my side by side? If it is dry, it can kick up a lot of dust. Hey, it's the desert and dust is a fact of life. Well, to be considerate, you would drive as slow as is required to not kick up dust. So just, to, just, um, just look behind you and see, see how it's going. Um, now, if you're not near anyone, um, you could probably go a lot faster. But if you're near people and you're driving by someone's camp, slow down so that you're not creating dust. Okay, yeah. And sometimes you don't create dust uh, going, you know, seven miles per hour. And sometimes you have to go as slow as three miles per hour. Right. Not to dust. Depends on the, the soil that you're driving on as, as well as the, uh, the weather. And it can it, change it, quickly. You can, you can hit a patch of puffy dirt and it just everywhere and you have to slow down for that. And I, I, might, I might toss in that anybody on an ATV, OHV, uh, any, any side by side, that's their world. They're used to dust. They don't see dust, whereas we might be feeling like we're coughing and choking to death. <laughs> and again, those, those, those differences. Um, so, um, you know, if we can each understand where each is coming from, but yeah, if they, and, and this, this is the universal sign for please slow down. And, you know, you might get another sign back but it doesn't hurt to ask. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Deborah, now that you're, uh, when I first met Deborah, she was in a van. Now she's in an RV. So this seems like an appropriate question for you. Okay. It's, it's from John's RV. And he's, he asked, I don't know where to dump my tanks. Do you have a method to find dump sites for your gray and black water? Yeah, I have only been in this, uh, this class C for six months, but I lived before going full-time on the road. I, I went full-time on the road in 2015. And two years prior to that, I lived full-time in an RV. And uh, we'd go out uh, camping on the weekends and holidays like we were just talking about. And there are some great apps for that. And I'm sure that there is going to be uh, covered in a, a another class. And, and if not, you can ask us in the chat afterwards. But um, there are apps for that. And also, if you find yourself in a bind, if you can't find one nearby, like here in Quartzsite, there's different RV parks that let people come in and pay 10 12 $20 just to use the dump station. And if you can't find that, then you can always go to like a county park or a state park and uh, pay that fee and, you know, stay overnight and, and uh, take advantage usually of a laundromat that they might have there and everything. But I've never found it to be a problem to find places to dump. And there's even some city parks that have free dumps. So uh, check the app. And if you know we're going to be traveling, call ahead of time if you can. Very gray tank that's only 15 gallons and it, it usually only gets to about half full and so I try my darndest to go to free dump sites um, because I hate paying ten dollars to dump seven gallons of gray water um, but they haven't been that hard to find. Do you have apps or anything that either of you use to, to find them? I use a combination of Campendium and iOverlander. Um, there are specific um, Santa Dump apps and things like that. I think RV Parky has that information. A lot of different places to get that information. That's what I was gonna say. Campendium and RV Parky are the two that I use. Okay, great, very good. Okay, um, this is for Joni. Uh, and it's being asked by Al Bundy. Yeah. <laughs> it says, I find pallet nails all around the campfire rings out on BLM land. How do you deal with them? There's so many, it would take me hours to clean them all up, but I don't want to get a flat either. Uh, about a year ago, I purchased a, a floor magnet at the hardware store that's about, it's about this big it's flat and it's on a handle a telescoping handle and so that's how I deal with them and then I just take a heavy duty plastic bag and will put the magnet inside the bag and scrape it off I'm using I'm wearing gloves so that I don't get rusty nail you know splinters and um, I have I have picked up there was one place where um, it was actually Plumosa Road. I picked up a bag that was like this much just in one tiny spot. Wow. That's a, a magnet is a great idea. Yeah. Okay, uh, Deborah, Vivian Aldridge's question. Where do you throw your poo away if you are living in a car? Uh, Vivian, well, Joni did a good job of covering that under the, under the leave no trace. And, um, you know, if it depends really on how you are, are you using a composting toilet? Are you using a, 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 a gallon bucket with wood shavings, kitty litter, whatever. But uh, as Joni covered, always dispose of things properly. And, and I, you know, one of my big things is when we go into town, don't, don't overtake retailers and gas stations and, and everybody's, uh, 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 waste bins. Uh, you can go here in, in Quartzsite, for example, there's a transfer station outside of Quartzsite. There's a transfer station outside of Parker. And they usually, especially right now when people are in the area, will let you come in for free or it's a nominal fee. And you dispose of it properly, just like you would, I think, diapers. <laughs> exactly. Very good. Now I try to throw my poo because I do do a poo bag. I try to throw my poo bag away in a in a receptacle that isn't hand emptied. So if it's a 
um, a dumpster that's going to be mechanically emptied or in a transfer station or a, or a um, landfill. Yeah. And, and I just want to add to that, that, you know, even if you find a, a dumpster, be sure that it's available to the public because you can get ticketed for theft of service for using maybe that local gas station's dumpster behind there or hotel's gas station um, dumpster or, or grocery store or whatever. Those, those if, if they're not for public use, don't use them. <laughs> yeah, it's just the, it, it is etiquette. Yeah. Very good. Okay, uh, this is for uh, Joni. Uh, what do you do if you catch someone leaving trash, but they still won't pick it up? Then I pick it up. Yeah, um, I remember one day um, I was um, near the Kern River, on the Kern River, and it was Earth Day of all days. It was the weekend. It was a very popular weekend spot, and these um, six guys came and camped, and brought all brand new stuff, left all the packaging. We ended up picking up 10 wow. bags, full garbage bags of garbage from two, uh, from one night. It was a, an overnighter from six guys. Wow. Thank you for doing that. But you have to do it. Yeah, you have to do it. It was a great thing to do on Earth Day, I guess. <laughs> And, and I've done that. And in those circumstances, I have gone into a business and said I was out camping and I picked up a bunch of trash that people left behind. And I can I please put them in your dumpster? And they're usually like, yeah, thank you for doing that. And, and we'll let you do that because then you have to dispose of what they didn't dispose of. Well, this area had a dumpster. So. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good idea, though, Deborah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, Deborah, uh, this is from Kevin Knoll, and he asks, can you bury biodegradable toilet paper with your poo? No. My answer. No, I, I wouldn't do it. No. Biodegradable does not biodegrade very quickly. In the desert. Especially and, in the desert. And it, it, yeah, it depends on where, where you're camped and no. And, and, and it takes a while for it to degrade no matter where you're camp. And there's no guarantee that some animal's not going to dig it up or that something's going to happen. And, and then it's strewn everywhere. So no. Yeah. So it's biodegradable for sewer systems, not for burying. Really good point. Really good point. Okay. Uh, this is for Joni. Is there, and it's from Lynette French. Is there a website reference to the no trace etiquette list you gave us today on the Howler Facebook page or website? I'm a visual person and to see the list would be helpful. Thanks. I don't know if we have it on the Howl website, but it's very simple. It's lnt.org and it's a beautiful website. I spent a lot, I, I just enjoyed, you know, every once in a while there's a really well-designed website and I just enjoyed browsing their website. Yes, yeah, it's a, it's really well done. Okay, uh, this is for Deborah. I'm checking the time. We got six minutes left. Uh, okay. Carolyn, Sir, Sir, oh my, Searles, C-E-R-O-N-L-S. Okay. Is, is it okay to bury vegetable fruit scraps or end eggshells? For example, things that you would put in compost. Oh man, that, that is so great. And for me, I, I'm sure that there are some real guidelines somewhere that you could follow to the T. But again, it depends on where you camp. For example, if you're going to try and bury those things in the desert, the desert can't decompose and decay things like maybe somewhere uh, in it. I'm not, I started to mention a state and I'm not gonna do that because I don't wanna cause controversy, but in, in a forest somewhere, where it can decompose quickly. Um, I, you know, I, I, I want to go with leave no trace, carry in, carry out, and and just, you know, that leave no trace it, when at all possible. Can it be done? Yes. Uh, do you have to? I don't think so. 
And it shouldn't be done um, even in areas where it could compost. It's more likely going to be dug up by wild animals before yeah. composted. Yeah. So it's a, it's that question of can it be done? Yes, and but should it be done? No. Thank you. Okay, um, Joni, this is from Darlene C. Uh, she asks, how ha, have you seen an increase in the intensity or volume of nomads, which warrants more discussion and and attention to etiquette? Thanks, Darlene. Yes. So um, yes and no. So <laughs> this year has been a little bit different in that we've seen a lot of inexperienced nomads on the road because of COVID. Um, and then quartzite is not as busy as normal because the Canadians can't come. So um, so there's so it's a yes and no. But yes, as far as um, needing more education, definitely. We have a lot more brand new nomads on the road and um, and, you know, some of those folks are in survival mode and just not e don't even have the bandwidth to research that sort of thing. So, yeah, and you don't know what you don't know. And, yeah, as, as we can gently in, um, instruct and educate people, um, the, the better off we'll be. Because I know in Oregon, um, national, in, in Oregon State Forest this past summer, they had to close a lot of the dispersed camping, or they closed it all the dispersed camping because people were leaving so much trash um, when COVID started. Thank you. Okay, Deborah, um, Body Beyond, if you make a run to town and meet someone in town uh, you'd like to invite to join the group, how do you check if it's cool with the group since you're not with them at that point? Well, I, you know, I, I, I love that technology these days. If you camp with a group and you, you can't contact anyone there, I, 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 I would be very surprised. I mean, right, you know, you can text, you can, you know, you can call, you can email, you, you can set up ahead of time. I, I love Joni told me, you know, sometimes she camps with groups and they do uh, messenger chat groups set up already. You can use WhatsApp. And, and I mean, and if you seriously don't know them well enough to be able to contact anyone there, it, 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 it's a great question, but I just got to, I, I go to, if you don't know them well enough to contact them from town uh, to, to ask, uh, then I wouldn't feel comfortable, especially bringing someone new in. So I, I would never bring someone new in without checking with my group. And especially if I didn't know the group well enough to check with them if I was out and about. So I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. And uh, if you're camping with a group, you, you probably want to set up a way to be able to communicate with at least a few of them in the group somehow, some way. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, communication is so important when you're camping with a group. Now, I do have uh, some okay, of my friends. Gonna... Oh, some of my friends have invited people to camp with them when they've been camping with a group, and they'll just move away from the group and camp with a new person. Another option. Yeah. Okay, Joni, uh, this is from See More Clearly. And uh, she asked, what was the app you mentioned for camping uh, on BLM land, uh, the public lands? Yeah, for finding out if you're actually on BLM lands, it's the U.S. Public Lands app. And um, it is a paid app, but it is well worth it. And it's actually, um, it's created by one of our speakers later on this week, um, Technomadia, Chris and Cherie. They're going to be presenting the mobile internet session uh, on the 17th at 10 o'clock. Very good, uh, Joni and Deborah. This has been a great presentation. Great questions from our viewers and, the, and your answers were, were very good, very good. Thank you. Um, so I just want to remind everybody that uh, Deborah's channel is called Deborah Dickinson and go down below in the, in the uh, description and click on that and check it out. Very good. She's been doing it for a while. 
And Joni's channel is called The Galavan. Again, go into the description, check it out. Right down there, yes. Thank you.